Listen, take your Bibles, if you will. We're going to be in several passages this morning. We're going to be in John. We're going to be in Hebrews. We're going to be in Corinthians. We're going to be in Colossians. We're going to be, I think, maybe Revelation for a moment, a couple of verses in Isaiah. So if you'll find all those verses, I'll give you 20 minutes, and uh, you can find those passages. But we are. This is sort of one of those topics that's going to require us to bounce around a little bit. Because here's the question that we're asking this morning. The question is, why must the Redeemer be truly God? Why must the Redeemer be truly God? Remember, we're in this series called Verified, and we're looking at those those, uh, uh, attributes, those characteristics, these truths that the Bible teaches us about Christ that verify him as our Redeemer. What are those things? Last week, we looked at the the, the truth that that God is uh, truly human, that our our Redeemer had to be truly human. And so the the natural follow-up to that is, then why is the Redeemer, why must the Redeemer be truly God? Because remember, these are the two natures of Christ. He is fully man. He is fully God. Last week, we talked about uh, the, the human nature of Christ, and today we'll talk about the deity. So why must the Redeemer be truly God? Here is the answer. That because of his divine nature, his obedience and suffering would be perfect and would be effective. That his suffering and his obedience would be perfect and would be effective. Let me ask you this. What is that one thing that you just can't do? That if that thing were to happen, if it were going to happen, someone else would have to do it. Here's an example for me. Here's one of those things I just can't do. Every Christmas, we put the Christmas lights on the house. And there's a part of my house that's really tall, and the peak of it's really, really tall. And I just can't bring myself to go up there. I just can't do it. My legs get shaky. I get a little bit nervous. I just cannot put the Christmas lights on that part of the house. So what do I do? I do what all men do, and I call my brother-in-law, Will. (laughs) And he's like seven foot eight, and so he can actually reach it from the ground. But he'll come over, and he's kind, and he's gentle. He doesn't call me names or anything of that nature. And he gets on my ladder and goes up the ladder, and he puts the rest of my Christmas lights on my, because I just can't do it. Another thing about me, listen, and I've carried this for years, and I can't figure it out. I must have got it from my dad. My parents are here this morning. But I could, I never hit a home run in my whole life. I mean, I played baseball all the way up to high school, and I never once hit a home run. If a home run was going to be, if it had to happen, it was going to have to be someone else doing it. I just couldn't do it. I bounced one over the fence one time. I thought it went over, and I ran the whole bases with my hands up, and finally the ump was like, hey, man, it bounced over. you got to go back to second. Really embarrassing. (laughs) Sad. This close. What is that thing for you? What's that one thing that you just can't do, and if it had to happen, someone else would have to do it. Now, this sounds strange, and it's a bit of an illustration to prove this point. Only one person can save you. Only one meets the requirements, if you will, that would be required to save you. There is only one. Listen to these few sentences from um, an article for uh, the Gospel Coalition. Only Christ, as God, could bring a sacrifice of infinite and eternal value to God that he would appease heaven's wrath towards sin. By virtue of his divine nature, remember, we're talking about the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. He is able to earn for us eternal life and favor with God. Jesus is fully man. Jesus is fully God. Now, there will be some that will try to make the argument that the Bible does not teach that Jesus is God. And that is just false. As a matter of fact, the Bible explicitly affirms the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. Look at the person next to you and say, Jesus is God. Go ahead and do that. 
And the Bible explicitly affirms that. So I want to take a few moments and I want to talk about how the Bible affirms the deity of Christ because only God can save. And because only God can save, well, then that means our Redeemer must be God. Jesus is God. Listen how John opens up his gospel by declaring the eternal nature of Christ. Here's what he says. In the beginning was the Word. You notice the Word is capitalized there. That's Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is God. What about Colossians chapter 2, verse 9? For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In Christ, the whole deity, fully God, fully man. Jesus also numerous times affirmed his divinity, affirmed that he is God. On one occasion, he's teaching, and he's talking about himself, and as he's claiming these truths about himself, the Bible says that they got really angry at him, that hearers got angry at him for his blasphemy, as they accused him of. Why would they accuse him of blasphemy? Because he is proclaiming the prophecies about the Messiah are fulfilled with his coming. And they got upset and they got angry. Matter of fact, John 10, 33 says this, you being a man, make yourself God. Meaning this, they're making the accusation that Jesus is claiming of himself to be God. What we know is it's true. Jesus is God. And so just to make sure you all get it, look at the other person next to you and say, hey, Jesus is God. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> What's the point that I want to leave you with today? Jesus is God. Matter of fact, let's just say it all together. You ready? One, two, three. Jesus is God. Amen. Only Jesus can save. We even see in the book of Revelation that the description of Jesus is that he is the Alpha and Omega. He is the one who was and is to come. Jesus is God. And we could go on for, we could go, I mean, I've, I've allotted two hours for this sermon. We could go four hours today just talking, I'm just joking, not two hours. Jesus is God. Only God can save a person from their sins. And if Jesus is the Redeemer, well, then Jesus is God. Fully man, fully God. Let me say it this way. Last week as we talked about the human nature of Christ, that, that aspect of Jesus that's also required for our Redeemer, for Jesus to be our Redeemer, and we talked about this last week, then he must be fully human. And, and we described it this way, that the Redeemer being fully human means that he suffers and he sympathizes. That's what we talked about last week. That we have a God in Christ, a Redeemer in Christ, who suffered, meaning that he actually felt the pain of living in this world and dying for the sins of the world. He suffered, and he also understands us, that God gets us. If you didn't hear that sermon last week, go back and listen to it. Don't do it while you're driving. It, it can be a sleeper at times. But <laughs> suffer and sympathize. Well, what about this week as we look at his divine nature, the deity of Christ? Well, it can be summed up in these two words. He satisfies and he secures. He satisfies and he secures. So, so he, he must be truly God in order to satisfy and in order to secure. But to satisf satisfy what and satisfy whom and to secure what and to do it for who? Let's answer those questions quickly. To satisfy. What does he satisfy? Well, he satisfies God's wrath toward sin. Only Jesus can satisfy God's wrath towards my sin. Only Jesus can satisfy God's wrath towards your sin. That means that there is nothing else that can do it. 
This is the one thing that if it were going to happen, you can't do it on your own. You can't even call your brother-in-law in to do this for you. You can't call your cousin. You can't call your bank account. You can't call your good behavior. You can't call your morals. You can't stand underneath the religion and the, the worship of your parents. You can't do it for your kids. Only Jesus can satisfy God's wrath toward your sin. And this is something that had been prophesied uh, for centuries before. Isaiah is filled with this prophetic reality of our Redeemer being the only one that can satisfy God's wrath toward our sin. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 5 and 6. Let me remind you of a couple of them. He was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. Did you see that, that verse? Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Punishment for our peace. Our iniquity is laid on him. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is a prophecy of Jesus taking on the punishment for our sin for the purpose to appease God's wrath towards the sins of the world. Isaiah 53 goes on in verses 10 through 11 to make sure that we understand the nature of Jesus' substitution, the nature of his death, the nature of his, his laying down his life, this punishment that's being poured on him, and the result of it is that God's wrath would be appeased. Go to verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put, on, put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt... He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Those listening to this um, prophecy in Isaiah they would have understood this to be a substitution so that the wrath of God would not be poured out on the sinner who committed that sin, but rather would be poured out on the Redeemer. This is an awesome time for someone to say amen. Think about it for a second. Fully God stepping into our place, and only God could satisfy and secure. So Jesus puts on flesh. He walks among us. We already know in John that he is God and he is with God. And God put on flesh and he dwelt among us for the sole purpose to secure, to satisfy. God's wrath toward our sin and to secure our righteousness before God. This, this covenant that, that the Old Testament talks about, the way they would, they would uh, um, you know, year after year, they would sacrifice these animals uh, for their sin. This was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would ultimately do. And what Jesus would ultimately do is he would be the sacrifice that would appease God's wrath towards sin. The once and for all final sacrifice. In exchange, Jesus gave his life so that we can have life. I've said this before, but I, I think it's just so, um, it, it's just, it's, it's overwhelming, but it also explains perfectly the exchange that takes place because of our Redeemer. Meaning this, that when you die, and if you die in Christ, and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, here's what's going to happen. God is going to treat you as if you lived Jesus' life. That's overwhelming, isn't it? 
You know why it's so overwhelming? Because we understand the depth of our depravity. Some of you are thinking, there's no way. The week that I've had, the things that I've done, the stuff that I said. Listen, the kids are home from the summer, and man, I might, I don't know. I've, it's been a rough week. You're telling me that when, when I die, this imperfect person, this sinner, when I die, God is going to treat me as if I lived Jesus' life? And the answer is yes. You know why? Because Jesus allowed himself to be treated as if he lived your life. He laid his life down and allowed the wrath of God to be poured out onto him so that you would be secure and God's wrath toward your sin would be satisfied. But listen, if you make it about you, meaning that if you start to look at your own life and go, man, there's just no way, I'm just not good enough. Well, you're not good enough. That's why you needed someone to do this for you. Because you could never do it for yourself. You could never live the life Jesus lived. Ever. You don't, have, you don't have anything to bring to the table to barter with God for your righteousness in front of him. Someone else has to do it for you. So Jesus did it for us. Here's how the Bible would describe it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Listen to this verse. It's beautiful. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He made him who did not know sin to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the verse that's saying God is going to treat you like you live Jesus' life because Jesus was treated like he lived your life. He took the punishment of my sin. He absorbed the wrath of sin from God and satisfied it in full. I say this a lot, and, and it's true, that you're right before God right now. Right now, you are right before God right now if you are in Christ. Because that's what 2 Corinthians teaches us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In Christ, we stand before God rightly. Now, I hope that encourages you this morning. Because I'm sure there's one or two of us that have had a pretty difficult week when it comes to battling our flesh and our sin. It's just always there. Don't you just hate sin? It's just there. And sin just, your flesh just kind of just knows when to show up, right? It's always on Rogers Avenue for me. Always. I've, I say, I've said this a thousand times. I don't know why, but it's always there. So I'm just going to avoid Rogers unless I need Chick-fil-A. But it's just, it's just like it's always there, and our desires are always there. And like Paul, the things we don't want to do, we do, and the things we want to do, we don't do. We battle this flesh. How do we battle it without losing our minds? We teach ourselves and remind ourselves every day of the gospel. The life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And we just finally submit to this reality. We are not good enough to satisfy God's wrath toward our sin. We don't have it in us. Only Jesus can save. And so in your battle of your flesh, keep your eyes on Christ and never lose sight that God has, his wrath toward sin has been fully satisfied in Jesus forever. As the song goes, and I, I can't sing. I know Hunter sang in his sermon the other week, showing off and all that stuff. But <laughs> I'll just read it, all right? And you can sing it in your... Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. That's how we get through it. We live in the death 
of Christ. And so when your flesh shows up and that weakness shows up and that temper shows up or whatever that thing is that you've wrestled with and battled with, whatever new comes your way, you keep your eyes on Jesus. You live in the death of Christ. Only Jesus can satisfy God's wrath toward our sin. And so he satisfies Well, then he secures. Well, what does he secure and who does he secure it for? Well, Jesus satisfies and he also secures our salvation. He secures our eternal hope that once you put your faith and trust in Jesus, it is secure forever. Don't let your flesh and don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you that your salvation is not eternally secure. Because you'll let your flesh do that. Because you'll look at yourself and you'll think, oh my goodness, there's no way. I mean, look at me. Well, go back to the gospel. Of course, yes, look at you. The reason Jesus had to do this for you is you can't do it for yourself. I'm going to repeat this over and over and over. This is where Christians find their joy. This is where Christians find their peace. This is where Christians find their hope. This is where Christians, when when we're just at our, our lowest, we can look to Christ and be reminded that he did this for us. His life, his death, his burial, his resurrection for the forgiveness of my sins and my security right now. I am right before God right now. Listen to what the text says in Acts chapter 2. I love this verse because there's some little statements in it that just are encouraging. He is the stone you builders thought was worthless, and now he is the most important stone of all. Only Jesus has the power to save. His name is the only one in all the world that can save anyone. Most important stone of all. Only Jesus can save. Nothing else can save you and secure you except for Christ. But listen, even stronger than that, he secures our salvation and we are forgiven once and for all. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Flip over there real quick. We're going to spend some time here in Hebrews. If you've never read through Hebrews before, listen, Hebrews is all about Jesus being better. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better. He secures our salvation once and for all. And he forgives once and for all. Secured forever. Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1, says this, Since the law was only a shadow of the good things to come, And not the reality itself of those things. It can never perfect the worshipers by the the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered since the worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Year after year, they would have to go and they would have to make sacrifices. And year after year, they would have to be reminded, uh, this is how you're right with God. Year after year, to be reminded of their transgressions and their iniquities. And they would have to offer blood of these uh, goats and bulls. And and, and you just read that that a, a goat or a bull or a sacrifice could not eternally and forever and once and for all forgive you of your sins. You would have to come back again the next year and the next year and the next year. And so what is the answer now? What do we learn about Jesus? We learn that Jesus is the once and for all, for all time. Meaning you don't have to keep going back to Jesus year after year, month after month, week after week, day after day, hour after hour, minute by minute, seconds after seconds, I mean on and on and on, to ask and seek for salvation. Once God saves you, you are saved forever and eternity. It is locked. It is secure because of Jesus' once and for all sacrifice. 
Hebrews 1, go back to Hebrews 1. You know, Hebrews chapter 1 is, is, is one of my favorite chapters um, uh, because the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1, he doesn't give one command. He doesn't give a one do this or don't do that. The whole chapter of Hebrews 1 is just, hey, Jesus is better. Jesus is the one. Nothing else is better than Christ. Jesus is exactly who you need. Chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. And in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. Jesus is God. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature. This is a verse that is teaching and showing the natures of Christ. He is fully God. He is fully man. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Two things. Remember, once and for all, Jesus saves once and for all. No other work has to be done for you to be forgiven for your sins, of your sins. Notice what the text says. It says that he made purification for his sins. We'll come back to that. And then he sat down. You know, a priest never sat down. You know why? Because there was always work to do. This priest would mediate between man's sin and God, and they would follow the law, and that priest is always working, always working. Why? Why? Because we're so sinful. There's always a customer there ready to make a sacrifice for their sins. Always working. Always working. Jesus lived. Jesus died. He was buried. Jesus walked out of the grave. It's finished. No more work to be done to secure your salvation. He sat down. No more work to be done for you to be made right with God. There's nothing else that needs to happen for you to be right with God right now. Jesus paid it all. Jesus satisfied fully God's wrath towards sin. And Jesus has secured your salvation for eternity if you're in Christ. It also says that he made purification for sin. Purification is both an action... And purification is a result. This is what this means. This means that Jesus took away our sins, listen to this, as well as cleansing us from all the guilt associated with your sin. That's so difficult to get our minds wrapped around, isn't it? You know why it is? Because we're sinners. (laughs) We still feel guilt when we sin. We still struggle with our flesh. I've had this conversation with many, many people. Listen, I've had this conversation with myself. Do you know that when your sin shows up, of course there is a conviction and a guilt. Why? Because the holiness of God is, a, is, is, is something that we need to pursue. We need to hate sin. We need to push away against sin. But listen, never feel That when the world crashes in on you, maybe it's because of your sin, that that's God's wrath pouring out. There are people I've heard this uh, in one way or another say, you know, I just know I'm just walking around and God's just going to take me out. God's just mad at me because of the way I live my life. God's just upset with me because of my past. God is angry at me because I'm a sinner. No. The wrath of God towards sin fully satisfied in Jesus. Do not view God as this angry God hovering over you, just waiting to knock you down. No, God loves you. You know, the Apostle Paul's going to describe it this way, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and Christ did this because of God's great love, which he has for us. The cross is a commentary of God's love towards you. The cross is a commentary of God wanting uh, you to be right. It's, It's a commentary of God reaching out to you saying, I've made a way for you to be right. The cross screams that God is good. And some of you need to hear that this morning. Listen, I need to hear that this morning, that God is good. And I can pursue God and I can walk with God. And it's this kind of perspective that fuels our passion and drive for holiness. 
out of a love that God has for us, uh, because he gave Jesus in our place, and Jesus is our substitution, it's out of that that I pursue holiness and righteousness. It's out of that that I battle my flesh. It's out of that that I see sin for what it is. It's there to still kill and destroy me, to lie to me, to try to convince me that there's something better than Jesus out there. But it's out of my understanding of God's good nature and his love for me and his desire for me to be made right with him that I work, that I toil, that I pursue. That yes, even when my flesh shows up and I find myself in seasons of weakness, whatever that looks like for us as humans, I keep my eyes on Jesus. Why? Because Jesus forgave me once and for all. I keep my eyes on Jesus because he secured my salvation. I keep my eyes on Jesus because he satisfied God's wrath towards my sin. I keep my eyes on Jesus because he is fully God. He is fully man, verifying him as my redeemer. And this morning, my hope, my hope is that you would be reminded of that. Maybe you walked into the doors this morning and there's, there's sin in your life. You know, this, this, this uh, verse that we read about this sin that so easily entangles us. Run to Jesus. Keep looking to Christ. Trust Jesus. Pursue holiness. Walk with him. Be reminded this morning uh, that you're right before God right now. Don't let your flesh and don't let your sin lie to you. And don't let the enemy try to convince you that you're not right before him right now. And one of the strongest things he does is he tries to just continuously remind you of how weak you are and how how your flesh, uh, how depraved it is. And try to convince you there's no way you're forgiven. Look what you've done. There's no way you're forgiven. Look, look Look at what you said. There's no way you're forgiven. Look at how you acted or behaved. I mean, just pick your poison. But if we make it about ourselves, well, then, yeah, we're going to live in this this continuous cycle of exhaustion, just trying to be right. But if we make it about Jesus and we finally just submit to the fact that our life and our eternity and our salvation and our forgiveness is secure because of what Jesus did, that's where we find rest. That's where we find hope in the midst of our own depravity. It's where we find peace and knowing that one day God is going to make all things new. Resting in the fact that if you are a Christian, this life is the only hell you'll ever know. And one day, all things that are old will pass away and the new things will come. And you know what Revelation 5, 9 says? And we're going to sing a new song. And the toil is over. The battle is over. It's already over, by the way. We're just journeying that way. That's where we find peace, and that's where we find hope. And so as a follower of Christ this morning, listen, be reminded, Jesus is God. And because Jesus is fully God, then Jesus is enough to satisfy God's wrath towards your sin. Jesus is enough to secure your eternity in a real place called a heaven Jesus is enough because Jesus is God. Let's say that one more time. Jesus is God. If you're not a follower of Christ, and I know all of this, I mean, this could be, it's overwhelming because there's just, there, there's so much here, and this is just a 30-minute talk, message, sermon, whatever you want to call it. There's so much there, and, and it should, and my prayer is by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to produce some questions in some of your hearts and minds. And I want to encourage you to ask those questions because here is the facts. Here, Just laid out plain and simple. This is what we believe about what the Bible teaches. Jesus has made a way for you to be right with God. If you reject Christ, well, then you're hoping that you're going to be able to do enough. And listen, you won't. You can't. You know why? Because you're not full of God. You're not God at all. You're not Jesus. Only Jesus can redeem you. So should you choose to reject Christ, then here's what will happen. You will stand before God on that day, and you will pay the wages for your sins. 
What does the Bible teach us about the wages of our sins? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. And so if you reject Christ, well, listen, this is the only heaven you'll ever know is right now. Because you'll have to pay the penalty, and that penalty is death. But if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, and you don't reject Christ, the only one that can save you, you can't save yourself. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. The promise is, is that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those who confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus died and God raised him from the dead will be saved. We can trust that when God says, listen, I will cleanse you of all your sins and unrighteousness because of Jesus. We can trust that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he is enough. You know why? Because he's verified the Redeemer. And he is the only one that can save you. And so my prayer for you this morning is if you're not a follower of Christ and you're just wondering, maybe you're like, man, I don't even know. Then I want to encourage you today to do something about that. To make a, take a step towards asking questions. Take a step towards um, um, seeking out what does this all mean and, and, and why is it just Jesus? I know this might bring a ton of different questions. I want to help you answer some of those questions. I want to make a way for you to, to, to ask those questions here in just a moment. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if you would, just bow your heads, close your eyes. Christians, our response, like it is each week, is to, is to one, focus in on what Jesus has done. Maybe for you, it's, a, it's time to repent of some sin. Just call out some sin in your life, to battle your flesh, to just get honest and real about where you are. Because you're reminded today that Jesus is enough. He's paid it all, and that is the catalyst for us to live out a life of holiness and righteousness. I need to be reminded of it. You need to be reminded of it. Rest in the gospel today. Maybe your flesh is just eating at you and just sin is eating at you. You just feel defeated. Well, my prayer is today that you'll be reminded that victory is in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you have all that you need. So keep fighting. Keep plowing. Keep driving through the the, the brokenness of this world with your eyes on Jesus. If you're not a follower of Christ this morning, listen, I want to encourage you today to do something to take a step towards asking the questions you need to ask. Maybe you don't have any questions. You're like, hey, today is the day I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus. Listen, one of two things you can do this morning. You can take one of those red Connect With Us cards. You can fill it out. You write your name on the front. Just write on the back. I need a pastor, minister, staff member to call me. Place it in one of those black boxes, and we'll call you this week, and we'll help you in every way we can. We'll answer any questions you have, pray with you, whatever it is you need. You can do it that way today. But I want to encourage you not to do it that way. You can leave today having talked to someone about the most important thing, and that's Jesus. We say this all the time. A hundred years from now, all that's going to matter is Jesus. So why wait? Why don't you talk to someone today? In just a second, I'm going to pray. We're going to respond in worship. Will's going to come up. He'll give us some parting words. We'll be dismissed to go to our community groups. And when we're dismissed, listen, I'll be hanging around down front. I'd love to talk to you today about what it means to put your faith and trust in Jesus, to follow Christ, to help you make the most important decision you'll ever make, and that is what you believe about Jesus. Why do that today? Why do it today? Because you're not promised another second when you walk out of these doors. And why not seek out the most important thing today? Ask the most important questions today. Make the most important decision today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You're hearing it now. Let's deal with it now. Father, we do love you. We do thank you. And God, I pray, God, that God is for Christians that we're reminded today that you are fully God. And because of that nature, you're enough to secure and to satisfy. But God, you've made a way for us in Christ, not because of our works, but because of Jesus. Remind us of that today. Let it bring peace and hope and rest into the daily activities and grind of our lives. Lord, for those that are not followers of yours, for those that have questions, Lord, I pray that today they will do something. They won't leave here today without doing something. God, we, we love you. We thank you for your word and how it teaches us and guides us and reminds us and shows us. And God, we worship you. Be with us this week as we walk with you. 
as we battle our flesh, our imperfections, remind us even in those things that we needed Jesus. And that's exactly what we got. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Would you